Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to PMF IS Current Affairs Prelims Test Series, and uh, my name is Ashish Malik. In this particular video, we would be discussing about the last twenty questions of the test number nine. And before we begin, I really want you to go and check out the test series of PMF IS where you can practice one thousand very high quality MCQs available at just rupees four nine nine. Do not forget to check it out. The link is given in description below. So now let's begin with the discussion and let's see um, how we were supposed to approach these particular questions. So question number eighty one on your screen talks about the Rajya Sabha elections. Now very interestingly, it says the reforms. Very specifically, the question has asked that uh, which of the following reforms have been made in the Rajya Sabha election since independence. So very interesting uh, question, I would say. so what exactly has happened for that you really need to know have you really need to know the uh, the changes in depth and you should be aware of all these kind of information and specifically because we are into a election year this time such kind of questions are quite expected now the one very major change that has happened to the election of rajya sabha was in 2003 Before two thousand three, there was a rule that whosoever is going to a, a contest for the for the Rajya Sabha seat, the person has to be from the same state. But in two thousand three, that domicile or residency requirement, the candidate has to be of the same state from where Rajya Sabha seat for which Rajya Sabha seat he is contesting. That provision was removed, and now it would be sufficient. if he or she is an elector in any parliamentary constituency in the country now now you can contest for the rajya sabha seat and and very good example to remember is the former prime minister of india mr manmohan singh he was rajya sabha member from assam and that is that is very interesting way you can remember that right now to be a member of rajya sabha you don't have to be uh, the you don't have to have a domicile of the same state of one more important change happened in 2018 earlier even the nota option was available for the rajya sabha election but after the orders of supreme court in 2018 none of the above the nota option none of the above option was actually removed for the election of rajya sabha and even vidhan parishad called the legislative councils by the election commission of india So right now, if you want to vote for Rajya Sabha or Legislative Council, you are not going to get the none of the above option. So you really have to make your vote count. Every single vote needs to be counted, and there has to be no nota option. Another very interesting thing that has happened when it comes to the Rajya Sabha elections, and that was introduction of open ballot system. Earlier. there used to be the secret ballot system like we have in lok sabha polls right like like if i am going to cast my vote i'm not i'm not supposed to show it to everyone that who am like you know for whom i am casting the vote right of course it is my personal thing so who whatever is my response uh, as as a as a voter i am voting in a secret ballot system without showing my choice to anybody but for rajya sabha elections the system is open ballot system means now under this an elector belonging to the political party has to show the ballot paper after making his vote to the nominated agent to their political party why it was done why the system changed from secret to open ballot system very simple reason it was done to curb the cross voting and to wipe out the role of money power during the rajya sabha elections many times it was seen that if i belong to party x and in that secret uh, ballot system i sometimes used to cross vote and i'm going to support the candidate of other party maybe because of some ideological infringement maybe because of some money power or some kind of horse trading anything and now it there is a rule every every vote uh, be it uh, be it from you know the mla because ultimately mlas are the one voting for the rajya sabha seats now it's a rule you have to show your vote to the party uh, representative so that there is no cross voting and there is no money involved for the voting of the rajya sabha that is the case now if you look at the question guys of course all three systems are absolutely 
correct very straightforward simple question easy to attempt with a b c i mean 1 to 3 being the correct code here without any problem straight away question and you really have to prepare well the topic of elections parliament these are very important and must prepare topic for the upsc prelims another uh, next question 82 is also with respect to the elections itself now the question says how many of them how many of the elections or how many of the following elected by the open ballot system so clearly i told you member of rajya sabha they are not the open ballot not for president not even for vice president this open ballot system we just have discussed in the last question is for rajya sabha elections and also legislative councils so clearly my option would be only and only one it has to be only one easy straightforward because the two questions are quite related i'm not going to repeat the two right so now you know the uh, option so what is an open and secret is something you already know of right that brings us to the next okay now they, it may be asked okay fine for the lok sabha or for the uh, vice president or president which kind of system is is used you may have this question so please remember vice president election and president election in india we we take we they are held as per the system of proportional representation by means of single transferable vote please remember the name of the system this is the system by which president and vice president elections are taken into account what is this single transferable vote see let's say if there are four candidates if there are four candidates uh, candidate a b c and d for a uh, for any rajya sabha seat or oh, sorry for any uh, president election there are four candidates or for vice president post there are two three four whatever candidates so if i so if uh, the elected members of rajya sabha lok sabha if they have to vote so what they are supposed to do they are not just going to write one name or like my choice my my choice is person number a so of course i am going to give most first preference to a but i am also supposed to give preference to other people as well so that in case there is a tie let's say my choice is a d c and b that's the perfect order i have done that in case uh, in case of the tie of the votes then the second choice is going to get considered and that is why so that there is uh, there is not going to be a repetitive election for the president and vice president this single transferable vote kind of thing was introduced along with the secret ballot of course secret ballot is there but this is an additional information that's why i told you and for the lok sabha members you know it is there is a secret system by but by what system now the system we use for the lok sabha election is first past the post system first past the post you are not supposed to get 50% plus votes you are supposed to get maximum then your then your uh, competitors you, even even if like let's say out of 100 votes even if you have got let's say 27 votes you can still be a winner if your other competitors have got 26 24 25 you know this kind of votes so you can still be a winner by not need not to cross the uh, half majority you can simply become you 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 don't have to cross the 50 percent mark you just have to be ahead of your competitor that is called first past the post system so the name of the systems are important you never know you may have a question coming like that where you actually have to figure out which system is for what election that brings us to the next question guys the question 83 now which statement is not correct be very careful which statement is not correct now here we are talking about india's first underground metro it's a very important topic very current oriented topic and it, it is something we should be aware of so first let's understand so very recently why it, why it was in news because india's first underwater metro was inaugurated by prime minister and it is in kolkata so you may have a question like this straight away in which of the following states india has got its first underwater metro it, the answer would be west bengal specifically kolkata and this is this is actually country's deepest metro station the name of that deepest metro station is Havra metro station now the moment i say kolkata the moment i say Havra, which river should come to your mind very logically it has to be hugli river a distributary of 
Ganga River. Hooghly is a distributary of river Ganga. It is Hooghly River on which we have Kolkata and the Havana Bridge, right? And uh, this tunnel, this tunnel that we have created, it is at a depth of 32 meter below the water level. And that makes this metro station as country's deepest metro station so far. Now, logically, if you go back to the question, very easily you can pick out which statement is not correct. You're talking about Kolkata, you're talking about Havana. Of course, it cannot be Ganga. I just told you Kolkata Havana is on uh, Hooghly River, not Bitham. So only one statement is wrong. Uh, this one is wrong, other two statements are right. So very simple question, easy to attempt without any trouble. Okay. Now sometimes your presence of mind is what is required. Sometimes you can really give the answer based on your, not just based on your knowledge, but also based on your uh, presence of mind. Question 84 says, this question is about the inner line permit, ILP. Now this is something which again is a very important topic whenever you, whenever you talk about the northeast states of India. ILP is one such very sensitive issue which we all should be aware of. What is this inner line permit system that we need to understand? So basically guys, the history of this ILP system, ILP is basically an official travel document that allows the inward travel of Indian citizens into protected or restricted areas for a limited period of time. The real concept was introduced by Britishers in 1873. There they brought out a regulation called Bengal Eastern Frontier Regulation and the modified and present day version of that, uh, uh, that regulation is inner line permit that we have. So why and how it works? Let's understand. In India, in Northeast India, there are only four states as of now which are under the ambit of ILP. So please remember, inner line permit, the, the simple reason is you are an outsider. You do, you do not belong to that state. You are an outsider. So the, the whole idea is uh, that you actually need to take some special permission if you are traveling to these particular four states, namely Arunachal, Mizoram, Nagaland, Manipur of these four northeast, also Lakshadweep and Himachal. So in if you if you want to travel to any of these six states, four being northeast, one being island, one being Himalayan state Himachal, if you are traveling to any of the six states, you really need to have permission from the concerned state government. You need to have the permission. You need to specify why you want to travel to that particular state. And once you get that permit, inner line permit, then only you can travel. So the concerned state government issue, and please remember, you, can, you, you will get the ILP permission only and only for the travel purpose. You're not supposed to go there and live there permanently. You're not supposed to go there and start your business something. No. In these special six states, you can only travel and traveling permission would be granted. When there is any foreigner coming to that area, the foreigners need protected area permit. For Indians, we have inner line permit. For foreigners, we have protected area permit. So two, three things we need to understand. The whole idea, the Britishers started this kind of system basically to protect the crown's commercial interest by preventing Indians of that time from trading in these special regions. They have their own interest, but now Indian government still following the system basically so that any outsider cannot go and encroach in these special areas. That is, in, that, is, that is the present context. So today, here it is clearly written guys. Today the main aim of this ILP to prevent the settlement of other Indian nationals in the states where ILP regime is prevalent in order to protect the indigenous and the tribal population. Because you, if you look at all the six units, the one UT and five uh, states, here you will have significant indigenous tribal population. And that's why this policy of exclusion is still relevant. It is still there. Originally, it was to keep Indians outside those areas. Now you are, you are keeping the outer, uh, uh, the people of outside that states so that so as to protect 
uh, the rights of these kind of people. I hope this, this information is clear to everyone. Okay. Now if you go back to the question. Now question which statements are correct. Now please look at statement number 2. Do you think ILP is applicable to all northeastern states? No. And I, and I tell you n number of times uh, statement like all, only, always, never. Be very careful with this. ILP is only for four northeast states, not for all northeast states. So this has to be wrong. Again, see traveling, tourism, it's a state subject. So if you are going to any state and you want to take the ILP, the permission of ILP, central government has nothing to do here. We just discussed it's the state government and very logically you're traveling into the state the state is going to give you permission. Central government has nothing, no role here to play. It's the state government that solely issues you ILP for travel purposes. So even sec third is wrong. First and fourth statements are absolutely correct. So how many statements are correct here? Two statements only. Now very logically, I'm not saying, I'm not saying if, if you are, if you have, let's say you are not very well, you don't know many facts about the ILP. Still, these two could have been eliminated by your own logical reasoning analytic skills. Isn't it guys? Because both looks very uh, off the track from what we, are, uh, what we are talking about, right? So even by going that notion, you could have at least eliminated number one, number, number two and number three. Uh, statement number four looks very logical, very, very logical. You think what inner line permit, if you do not know the concept at all, then there is a problem. But if, if you, even if you know a very basic, very basic uh, idea or the, if you have read at least once or twice the ILP, then you can solve the question very easily without any trouble. Otherwise, in for general student, I would label it as a medium level question, but you could have attempted it by at least taking some risk, by at least eliminating the most obvious ones, you could have still gear, uh, uh, you know, mark the question as the correct one. Okay, so question number, 85 very straightforward question easy to attempt global gender gap report i always tell you guys expect at least one question on report or at least one to two question on indexes do expect these two three questions are going to be there in the upsc for sure based on reports and indexes and every time i tell you the moment you see any index any report the first thing you have to notice is which of the following are releasing that particular report or indexes? Global Gender Gap Report released by World Economic Forum, WEF. Right answer is two. Easy, straightforward, you could have answered that. Now, what exactly, why we are so much focused on this report, we'll tell you. See, the Global Gender Gap Report, uh, it, it, it is published on annual basis by World Economic Forum since 2006. So what exactly it is measuring? The global gender gap. What is a gender gap, guys? Gender gap is basically the uh, gap between the uh, between two people based on their gender. Simply, in, to, to put it, it in a simple word, the political, social, economic gap between males and females of that particular country. So what exactly it measures? It measures the current state and evolution of gender parity. How good your policies are. How how. Uh, better you are implementing the policy to narrow the gap between male and female of your country. And the whole, the whole measurement, how does it measure? The whole measurement is done based on four key dimensions. That includes economic participation opportunities. You compare how many male population, how much male, male population is getting economic participation opportunities. How many female are getting the economic participation opportunities. Similarly, what is the level of educational attainment between the two genders, health and survival conditions, and political empowerment of males and their counterpart, uh, counterpart females. So based on these four parameters, and I, and I recommend you to prepare the four dimensions for the MCQ as well. You may have this question, the gender gap, gen, uh, global gender gap, which of the following are the dimensions which, are, which is a part of global gender gap. You may have this question. So please remember, try to remember these four important dimensions. Talking about the performances, here in global gender gap, the best performer is Iceland. Iceland, 90% gender gap closed. Means 
they have brought the status of male and female very much on par 90% gap is closed just small here their gap is there but you talk about India's rank not very good though India has improved eight places India used to be 135 earlier now India has become it is now India's rank is 127 out of 146 but again this is quite quite concerning level India has attained 36-37% parity in economic participation, closed the 64-65% overall gender gap. So where, where Iceland is, has closed 90% gap in total, in total based on all the four parameters, India has closed approximately 64% gap is what we have closed. Of course, there is a long way to go and India is doing good undoubtedly, but we really need to fasten up the process. India has attained parity specifically out of the four. You look at the you look at this educational one, guys. Now, this one on this parameter, India has actually closed the gap 100 percent We we are at we are, we have got the parity in educational attainment part. But this is the, the most poor part India still have to work upon is political and economic empowerment. Look, in terms of political empowerment, India is still has a long way to go. We are able to close only 25% gap so far. Means clearly there is a 75% gender gap in India when it comes to political empowerment. And similarly for economic participation, the gap is still huge. It is India is able to close only 37%. Still a very, very long way to go. 63% is still yet to be done. So India is very well performing in this part. India is doing good with health survival also. But for economic participation, very poor and political empowerment, though very, very poor. These two departments India has to work upon. I hope, I hope you got the answer and you got the basic uh, purpose and the ideas and all the facts, right? Moving on to the next one. The next question, again, very fact-based question. The question says, consider the following statements about the Matua sect. Now, what is a Matua sect? You really have to be... Uh, you really have to have some knowledge of history, some blend of current affair to solve this question. Now, how many statements correct? But what is Matua said? First, understand that. Then we'll come back to the question. Recently, why it was in news? Because the Matua community in West Bengal was in news. What is this Matua sect? This particular sect was established. The faith of this, of course, the Matua community. What, what religion they follow? What faith do they follow? The name of their faith is called the Matua sect. This particular faith established by a person called as Harichand Thakur. And this Harichand Thakur, when he established this faith, it come, he, uh, that faith used to comprise mostly Dalits or Nam Sudras. Means the lowest and the lowest category of social groups of that time. They used to participate in, the, in this uh, sect called Matua sect. So this is important. The majority of the people belonging to Matua sect, they, they used to come from Dalit families or the Nam Sudra families. Who was Harichan Thakur? Harichan Thakur was born in Bangladesh. That time it used to be Beng uh, Bengal presidency. It used to be part of India only. And Harichan Thakur, he belonged to Nam Sudra peasant family himself. Right? And at, after the Atma Darshan, he was regarded as God by by his people by the people of his community and from there started this cult called matua sect it originated as a reform movement initially 19th century in bangladesh and then of course the major objection the major uh, attack by this reform movement was questioning the practice of brahmanism there and by the time 19th century of course there were many there were many many illogical things which were happening in the Brahmanism of the time. And that's why this Matua sect questioned, questioned the practices of Brahmanism. And that's why and that's how it attracted the supports of the lower stratas of society. That is one good reason. Talking about Mr. Harichan Thakur, please remember this important fact. He preached, except for belief in humanity, all customary practices are pointless and distractions. So he put humanity as the biggest and the highest faith. 
He said we all should believe in humanity. We should not believe in this custom, practice and all that. It doesn't matter. So the whole idea of Matuva sect that he started, he said instead of believing, worshipping one person, one God, something like that, he said there has to be three guiding principles. Everyone should follow the three principles, truth, love and sanity. This is really, really important. And he also said, salvation is only through the Harinam. Harinam chanting, Harinam chanting, the chanting of the God and believing in Swayam Dikshti called the self-realization. And that's where and that's how he put all the emphasis. So now if you look at the question, the question is having all the three statements are as correct one. The questions about Matwa sect, very, very important question. But at the same level, it was a tough question. Tough, not that popular. Second, heavily dependent on facts. Look, how, how am I going to guess if the name of the person is correct or not? If the subcasts are correct or not? If the year was correct or not? So, right, very, very tough question. You can take a risk only if you know two, at least two out of three statements. If you are not very comfortable, you hardly know one statement, then you better you skip. But now, right answer here in this case is all three. All three statements are correct. But at least now the way I've explained you Matuva said, now you should be in a position to actually attempt this kind of question. Isn't it guys? Brings us to the uh, question number 87. Question is with respect to Indian Basmati rice. Indian Basmati rice. Important. Now, which statements are correct? Now, of course, there is a tussle um, which is going on on the name Basmati between India and Pakistan. Even Pakistani farmers, they also used to grow the uh, rice and they also used to call it Basmati. And that's why India is concerned about the reputation of the brand. And that's why the question is in news. Why? It is the Agriculture Research, Agricultural, uh, Indian Agriculture Research Institute called IARI. They have red flagged the illegal, there is illegal cultivation of the blockbuster varieties of Basmati in Pakistan that, that is going on. Indian Basmati is grown in Pakistan and, and it is marketed in Pakistan by the name the, uh, 1121 Kainat and Kisan Basmati. And that is why India is having all the con uh, concerns. They are not, Pakistan is not supposed to use the word Basmati because it straight away gives the image of India. In fact, in India, all varieties of Basmati rice are notified under the Seed Act 1966. Under this particular act, under the law, under the provision, official demarcation, geographical indication area of Basmati is only in seven northern states. In Pakistan, not at all, not at all. So clearly it is written in this act, the Basmati in India belongs to seven northern states. In fact, there is a Protection of Plant Varieties and Farmer Act 2001 also, which allows Indian farmer to sow, save, resaw, exchange, share the seeds of any protected registered varieties. And in this particular case, everything is also part of this act because they have registered. The varieties are registered. The varieties of rice are registered. That's why the case is also booked under protection of plant varieties and farmer rights. Please remember that. Now, here the question. Very obviously, you could have eliminated your way only. Read the statement number two. It says the protection of plant variety act. This is Indian act. This is India's act. Do, do you think that any act of parliament of India is going to allow India and as well as Pakistan farmers to sow and save the varieties of uh, Basmati or any protected varieties? Absolutely no. No, no, no. We are not in that uh, friendly relation with Pakistan. And uh, there is no such arrangement where Indian Pakistan farmers can do that something separately. No, that's not the case because of security concerns, obviously. So second statement is absolutely wrong. Is, is the first one right? Yes, sir. We, we have just discussed all varieties of Basmatis are notified under the Seed Act 1966. Mm -hmm. And in India, it is found in seven northern states. So now the answer, right answer is A. It, it was a medium level question. Uh, but look, this could have been solved simply by some common sense. Okay. 
first may have may may have given you trouble so that's why i'm putting it in a risk kind of category but uh, at least the second statement is quite can be solved with the common sense right that brings us to the question number 88 now what question 88 says question 88 is all about the black carbon it is in news very very often especially in the context of the pollution whenever any question is on pollution guys you are most likely to see some information coming on the black carbon the question says which statements were not correct that was the question so now talking about the black carbon you need to know certain things then we'll, we'll come back to the question so talking about the black carbon black carbon what is a black carbon it is commonly co known as soot maybe you are more familiar soot word is more popular it is more common okay so black carbon black carbon is also called soot it is basically a solid particle it is basically an aerosol it's not a gas don't think that black carbon is some carbon dioxide kind of gas no that's not the case black carbon is that solid particle the aerosol that actually contributes to the warming of atmosphere and this black carbon it, it is most likely produced from the incomplete combustion and specifically along with carbon monoxide along the carbon monoxide co because wherever there is incomplete combustion it is always going to be carbon monoxide doing its task so everywhere and it is it's a it's a high air high level pollutant air pollutant that you can relate to so but black carbon is not a gas it's a solid particle it's an aerosol it's a soot particle and as per 2016 studies the residential sectors they are contributing 47 percent of india's total black emissions now you may have this question coming as a separate mcq residential sectors contribute approximately half of india's total black carbon emissions then the industry is contributing 22 percent diesel vehicles uh, consisting of 17 percent open burning 12 and other sources 2 percent now please remember this question could have been asked as arrange the following arrange the following in terms of the percentage contribution of the sector into the black carbon so you so you better uh, remember it this way it is residential then industries then it is the diesel vehicles then the open burning then you know like that so do prepare in advance do prepare the list in this format also now talking about the black carbon be careful about what i am going to tell you what black carbon like i have just discussed of course it is going to increase the global warming how the black carbon warms the earth by absorbing more heat in the atmosphere reducing the albedo albedo is the ability to reflect the sunlight let's say let's say if this is a snow normal snow so normal snow what happens the moment if this is a normal snow so what is happening if the sunlight is falling on the snow a fresh snow is capable of reflecting it is going to reflect up to 85 percent of the sunlight that that falls on itself and that 85 percent is simply reflected and shattered by the by that by snow so if this is a normal case so obviously the the ice is not going to get melted why because because the the sunlight is already being reflected back and there is very there is no time practically to absorb the heat but guys what if in this normal on this normal snow let's say some pollutant particles have arrived and these these are the soot particles the black carbon particles now they have arrived and they got deposited on the ice like that or the snow like that understood now you see the black color no it's a very basic science you know black absorb all the sunlight why we should not wear black clothes during uh, the summer time we should avoid black clothes because they are going to absorb all the sunlight and that is exactly the case what's happening with the black carbon as well now instead of reflecting maximum sunlight is going to get absorbed in that black carbon and then what happens of course it there would be global warming there would be more glacier melting more more and more glacier are going to melt if black carbon is present otherwise without black carbon there is not much absorption over there so please remember this the black carbon 
is going to reduce the albedo because sunlight is not going to get reflected as it used to be on the snow because of black carbon there would be more absorption of sunlight rather reflection so black carbon i can say it's the strongest absorber of sunlight it is true and it heats the air directly absolutely and that's why it is so so dangerous black carbon once it absorbs all the sunlight and you know this basic fact once the sunlight is absorbed by any object then after absorption the object is going to emit infrared radiations yes every time anything gets heated up it after getting heating up it always going to reflect the ir rays clear everyone okay and one more thing black carbon of course it is dangerous but at least some relief for us is the black carbon is going to stay in atmosphere only for several days to week it's not a it's not a long term kind of thing it is not for long term so maybe within within a few days or few weeks the whole black carbon washes away or goes away okay so please remember that it's a it's still a short short uh, living pollutant kind of thing now if you look at the question which statement is not correct it asks no so clearly my last statement is not correct it says black carbon it is there for decades no sir it's a short lived it is going to be there for days to weeks maximum black carbon it increases global warming yes sir but then the question says each and every word of the questions are important the question says is it going to enhance the albedo effect albedo remember the reflection of the sunlight no sir it is not enhancing it is rather reducing the albedo effect and that's why there is there is going to be more and more absorption on that so clearly second is also wrong simply by eliminating option number 2 and option number 3 i could have got my answer oh i i i i needed the two together no yeah which statements are not correct so my answer has to be 2 and 3 this answer has to be 2 and 3 or maybe the question is like which is correct then in that case the answer is supposed to be uh, one only but since it says which statement are not correct here so clearly my answer has to be 2 and 3 these two are not correct very difficult not it it was a medium level kind of question and you could have uh, attempted by eliminating the options right so yeah easy question about black carbon try it. and there's a brown carbon also so since like like i've just mentioned i've just told you about black carbon do you guys know what is a brown carbon and if you know about the brown carbon do let me know in the comment section as well brings us to the next question another color we are talking about and that is the green credit from black carbon now we are going to green credit which statement is correct with respect to green credit guys the first statement okay now let's first understand the concept of the green credit that that again is important what is a green credit and why we are talking about it see there has been a uh, you know there are two aspects of the green credit scheme the government of india has recently started there is a group in india called constitutional conduct group it's a group of 91 former civil servants they wrote an open letter to the environment ministry where they are strongly opposing this so called green credit program which was started by the government of india way back in october 2023 where the aim was to incentivize environmental action through market mechanism this green credit program is very very much similar to the carbon credit program it's very similar to the carbon credit program so what is happening right now this is a, this is a forest area let's say this is this hole is a forest area and i am a let's say i'm a hospitality group and i want to open a five star hotel in the mid of the forest of course forest land i can't go and purchase nobody can purchase a forest land but under the green credit program the government can definitely allot me some area for my five star uh, hotel project if i promise to supplement that whatever area i am going to occupy for my uh, project equivalent to that area equivalent to that area i am going to you know sow the plants at some other area so tell me 
give me give me some land where i can where i can simply do some afforestation and then i can use this land for my commercial purpose understand the concept one every time one for every one plant or one tree that you grow you will get one carbon credit if you want to have 10 or 100 or 1000 carbon credits you have to plant that that many trees now you can plant it at any any place now why what is the problem the problem is you are actually granting you are diverting the forest which is which which was created some hundreds and hundreds of years ago you are you are actually giving that forest land in by by simply saying okay you go and plant trees anybody anywhere else do you think the that this portion is going to become forest in 10 years no you know the forest to become a forest it takes hundreds and hundreds of years so you are actually compromising on the wealth of the forest in the name of simply afforestation and there is no guarantee if that newly planted trees are really going to be or become the same forest or not there is no guarantee to that and that is why this group of 91 civil servants are quite quite uh, are very much in concern and that's why the news is important so what ha- exactly happened like i told you in a very general way now what what is this program so any company or even any individual can buy the green, green credits by taking action like the tree plantation so basically what happens simply the group the group uh, this particular group says why we are against this scheme because government aims to facilitate the entrepreneurs industrial industrialists to acquire the forest land as quick as possible by simply giving them green credits instead of providing the land you are simply now giving them green credits they believe the government intention behind this is to divert the forest land and that is why the whole objection is there that is one thing second thing is important if let us say under this program if any concerning authority or if any company or individual if you guys have to get the permission of green credit who is going to provide you that green credit which what, what's the authority so the authority to provide this green credit is this it looks like it looks like it should be under ministry of environment forest climate change but that is not the case for the green credit you actually the concerned authority is industrial council of forest research and education the icfre this is the body going to provide you grant you give you the green credits and while during the process of giving you green credits the activities which are eligible for green credits must include means you are you can you can, you will get some green credits but only if you are going to perform these things uh in in place of getting the forest area you must ensure these things tree plantation water management sustainable agriculture air pollution reduction so ultimately you will get the green credits if you promise and you do these activities right and again very interestingly state government also has a role to play here the state governments they must identify the degraded land parcels including the open forest and the wastelands for the tree plantation that is also there now these parcels should have a size minimum size 5 hectares or more where you are actually going to plant your saplings in the name of or in the, in the, in the name of diverting the original forest and that again how much land is degraded and where this plantation could have been done is simply the subject of a state government the state forest departments are quite capable of doing that so if you if you know the answer or if you have learned with me so far so at least you know the first statement is correct with respect to green credit but of course here the ministries is not this one you have just understood the authority behind the behind providing the green credit so this is wrong and again do you think central government has anything to do while identifying the wasteland or tree plantation no not at all it is not the domain the forest being a concrete subject here the responsibility given to the state government state government has to do that so clearly the right answer here how many are correct is only one the first one is correct the definition basically this first one is the definition of the statement okay
so that is that this is important so clearly i'm not i'm not denying i totally agree with you this question was very very high in terms of confusion i mean obviously a very normal it's a very normal thing every student will definitely think the best authority is going to be this ministry but that is not the case so this question was a tough one i recommend you to solve it or risk it only and only when you have 70% plus knowledge if you are not having 70% knowledge in this question and the statement looks alien to you then better to skip here the right answer is supposed to be only and only one two and three being incorrect clear everyone brings us to the question number 90 the question number 90 is with respect to the financial intelligence unit this is a very very powerful unit that we are talking about now which statements are correct about financial intelligence unit we need to see we need to learn we need to uh, first understand the concept so what is this financial intelligence unit what is this fiu so basically the financial intelligence unit the fiu india it was set up by government of india in 2004 what is this financial intelligence unit it's a central national agency responsible for receiving processing analyzing disseminating disseminating information relating to the suspect financial transactions if government thinks there is anything wrong with this financial if there is any suspected financial transactions they always going to give you some notice it is the financial intelligence unit ultimately going to settle things for you this is an independent body financial intelligence unit of india in independent body uh, directly reporting to the economic intelligence council which is headed by finance minister even this could have been a very good mcq as a stand alone one okay remember and yes for for registering a case if you are if you want to register a case under the pamla prevention of money laundering act if there is anything which is under this particular act it mandates this this particular act mandates every banking company financial institutions or intermediary must provide information to the financial intelligence unit for all the cash transactions if the cash transactions are exceeding 10 lakh rupees amount so everything you need to disclose in front of financial intelligence unit otherwise they will think there is something suspicious every banking company financial institutions intermediaries they shall furnish this financial intelligence units it's a compulsion out there it, they have to make sure if uh, and and if if anything is happening in cash then again they have to take care of that as well so uh, very interestingly both statements are wrong here why sir first of all first of all i have not said anywhere that this intelligence unit it's a statutory body under the pamla the two things are different they are not it is not a statutory body number 1 and again for registering any case under pamla transaction should be not more than 50 lakh but should be exceeding 10 lakh plus so even the criteria has changed so clearly both statements are wrong how many are correct neither one nor two what about uh, level difficulty level medium level question um uh, you really have to be you really have to be careful with the facts it's a fact based question take a risk i would say but again very very cautiously if you are absolutely if, if you are knowledge about the question is less than 40% then better you skip it than taking unnecessary risk it's a very important approach guys brings us to the question number 91 so what does this question 91 say the question 91 is about the inflation and here it says now this is a very simple question very very simple question of your uh, entire exam i would say we know about inflation we have read about it the core inflation and headline inflation these are two very important inflations whenever i use the word headline inflations headline inflation is is giving you the idea of uh, like all goods and services which are there so headlines are headline inflation includes all the goods and services but but there is a problem with headline inflation since it include all goods and services there are so many goods and services which are volatile in nature for example best example the energy and the fuel let's say a uh, energy or fuel you can say and the food so simply the food and the fuel you know they are highly volatile 
in the same financial year the prices can swing like crazy up and down so if let us say if i if i consider the headline inflation for my policy making do you think it's a good idea do you think it's a good idea to consider headline inflation for uh, for calculating or for policy making no sir maybe maybe this particular time or this particular month the the tomatoes have gone to 250 rupees per kg or uh, uh, the onion has gone to 250 to 30 rupees or 300 rupees per kg that need not to be the same next month maybe this is this is just for one month or something like that so hi the the normal um, headline inflation is not going to give me real picture there would be never ever real picture when i include hi so what is what what kind of policy or what kind of parameter do we need while making policies we always go and check out for core inflation core inflation gives you very true picture of sector wise inflation because core inflation always going to exclude two items one the food number two the fuel because they are being most volatile both being most volatile that is the difference so clearly my first statement is wrong here because uh, the the subject this statement belongs to headline inflation not the core inflation second statement is correct the uh, like uh, what is inflation general increase in prices of overall goods and service inflation reverse of that a general decline in the price of all overall goods and services is deflation it is just opposite just opposite of inflation and again when i talk about retail inflation it is never ever based on wholesale price it is very contradictory in itself why retail inflation retail inflation is is the one that is actually felt by consumers retail inflation is the one that is felt by us the consumers right so retail inflation is never going to be on wholesale price based it is always and always going to be based on consumer price index the cpi not the wholesale price index it's the consumer price inflation taking care of this one so clearly third statement wrong how many are correct sir only one is correct level very easy question straight away and you know the information these are very basic topics so right answer has to be a in this particular case brings us to the next very obvious very typical upsc kind of uh, question where on one hand you were given the gi tag products on the other hand the state and union territories were there you simply have to make sure if the gi product the geographical indication tag product if it is correctly matched to the state or not so of course we first need to learn about these products the very first product which was asked in the question the name is the narasapur crochet lace craft something like this that you are seeing in front of you this particular craft exclusively belongs to the state of andhra pradesh and it is it is geographically limited to andhra pradesh that's why it has got its geographical indication tag the gi tag this crochet lace that you can see this craft it 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 uh, is very very popular in the godavari region of andhra pradesh the second product called the banglar muslin now this is a traditional handloom craft from west bengal that you can see right here in front of you what is a muslin muslin fabric is very very it's very much in demand always it it has been demand this muslin fabric is made up of cotton spun to create threads with exceptional text uh, tensile strength surpassing other cotton product as well and ba this specifically banglar uh, muslin uh, muslin it belongs to the state of west bengal it is a gi tag already now again another product was the ambaji white marble this marble is quite highly calcic lot of calcium carbonate it has and ambaji white marble is really famous for its high calcium carbonate content and it is restricted to the town ambaji Ta ambaji town is in state of gujarat this ambaji white marble something you need to remember it is formed when limestone is recrystallized under the earth crust due to intense heat and 
intense pressure what do we call this process in geography we call it metamorphosis it is meta <coughs> excuse me it is the metamorphosis and there the limestone gets converted with this specifically ambaji white marble this marble is very soft has a waxy appearance as you can see in front of you and again another important product called the ratlam ratlam riyawan lasun ratlam is actually uh, it's it's a garlic variety by the way and it is cultivated in the riyawan village of the ratlam district in madhya pradesh if you have if you have seen the movie jab we met even in movie jab we met there is a ratlam station on which uh, the two actors got down so ratlam since then i remember ratlam since then it is in state of madhya pradesh so i think in movie i think in movie they showed it in uh, maharashtra i i think so not very sure but ratlam is a very very famous region um, and in that there is a riyawan village where garlic variety is very famous why it is so famous garlic variety because garlic of that area has higher oil content and very bold flavors than any other variety that is really really important guys so now if you come back to the question now you you see there are some problems and there are many problems in fact so second statement is the second pair is correctly matched but what about ambaji white marble it is not in andhra it is in gujarat the nasapur crochet lace not in mp it it belongs to state of andhra pradesh ratlam we just did not tripura it is the madhya pradesh so how many pairs correctly match sir only one because others are wrong now there is a challenge in front of you sir how to remember all gi products don't do that and nobody is asking you to remember all gi products but at least try to remember those gi products which have got gi tag in the last one year or two year so at least all gi tags of the last 24 months at least do read them do take a reading of them and the very first thing you have to remember of the gi product is the state that it belongs to so what about the question sir question was a little bit tough it is not easy to remember the gi tags i agree it's it's a tough one take a risk if you are in a position to know the things or you have to skip them because uh, you really cannot afford to simply guess here guess work is not going to do any good ever in these kind of questions another one in front of you where you have got the two pairs left side the missiles were given and right side the type of the missile was given helena astra prithvi and agni 5 agni 5 we already have covered in the last video so i hope you remember agni 5 yes it is a long range nuclear capable missile we i already discussed you the range that was 5000 km so agni 5 wala point is true but what about prithvi what about astra what about helena you really need to check out very interesting and important question when it comes to defense and missile systems of india helena the first missile is helena helena actually stands for helicopter based nag nag missiles are very famous nag missiles are fire and forget anti tank guided missiles of india and now we have developed because nag missile you always have to launch from the surface to surface they are surface to surface missiles nag missile but now we have developed a variant of nag and now we have named it helena helena is also anti tank guided missile but this can be fired from air it it is going to work from air to surface you can launch so we we always put helenas on advanced light helicopters so it is nothing but a variation or a variant of nag only and uh, this is anti tank missile very recently in fact helena weapon system inducted in indian army in fact there is another variant of helena weapon system called as the uh, dhruv vastra dhruv vastra is being inducted in indian air force also this uh, dhruv vastra is nothing but but a system of helena itself talking about the second missile the astra missile this astra missile is beyond visual range air to air missile astra is air to air easy to remember a for astra 
A for air to air. Air to air means from from one aeroplane, it's going to target the other aeroplane, not going to target the objects of on the ground. So Astra is having 110 kilometer head-on mode, a 20 kilometer in tail chase mode. So uh, this this particular uh, uh, you know missile is again very important, but when it comes to speed, speed is crazy. Mach 4 speed very very high speed it can maneuver upon okay ji okay so yeah you can see and it is it is uh, developed by drdo that also you need to remember guys what about the range look at the range guys the range is 70 kilometer the range of astra missile is 70 kilometer please do remember that range is important guys it is very very important then comes prithvi prithvi you, again you have to remember Prithvi is a short range ballistic missile. Prithvi is short. And uh, again it is developed by DRDO under the Integrated Guided, Guided Missile Development Program called the IGMDP. Agni 5th already we have discussed. I am not going to repeat it. You have already, I think it was question 61 if I am not wrong. In question 61 we already have discussed Agni 5 in detail. You go back to the question. Now you can, you are in a position to tell me which statements are correct or which are correctly matched. So only correct match was Agni 5. We just have understood the Prithvi is not air to air. It is the Astra missile which is actually air to air. It is the Prithvi which is short range ballistic missile. And clearly Helena has nothing to do with underwater experience. Helena is simply it is an anti-tank missile. It's a helicopter version of Nag missile. So clearly one, two, three wrong. How many are correct? Only one is correct. Is it easy to guess? Not at all. Not at all. Depending again, depending on your knowledge, you can take a risk. But in such cases, really, really difficult to guess, to do any guesswork. It's a pure fact based question. That's it. So you can skip it altogether. If you already have attempted good number of questions, then you don't have to really get into the trap of the of these kind of questions next question again very very simple map based question two straits were given straight of Babal mandab and straight of hormuz both are very very important not just very but very very important choke points the very very important choke points of indian ocean why why i'm talking about these two and th these are two are always covered in so many only we have covered in so, so many times Look, if you really want to get out of the Red Sea, you are traveling here. There is a very straight, very narrow strait here called the Bab Al Mandar Strait. So, Red Sea and Gulf of Aden are connected by the narrow strait called Strait of Bab Al Mandar. And you see here the Persian Gulf, and here is Gulf of Oman. This is Gulf of Oman. So, the narrow, very narrow strait connecting the two is Strait of Hormuz. Clear everyone? Now very obviously, these are two very obvious questions. So clearly you see the problem with the question. Basically it has been inter-exchange. And if you do not know that, it's it's really, really, uh, you know, not not very good because every, every year you have a possibility, questions coming on important straits. It's a very important topic, isthmus and straits that you need to prepare. There are places in news also and basic knowledge of world geography as well. Very easy, easy to attempt. Why? Both statements are wrong. Inter-exchange. Babal Mandab connects Red Sea with Gulf of Aden. Refer to the map. We just have, we just did that. Strait of Hormuz is a link between Persian Gulf and Arabian Sea via the Gulf of Oman. So clearly one and two are wrong. Both are wrong. How many are correct? Neither one nor two. Brings us to the question number 95. Question 95 is about, now this is a difficult question, a bit tough level question. The question is regarding the Saikas Sarsinalias. Sir, uh, now, what is this Saikas Sarsinalis? Is it native to southern India? Is it native to Sri Lanka? What we are talking about and what is this variety all about? So, first I would like to discuss, we'll come back to the question later. So, the variety that, that the question is talking about the question has has uh, you know the question is having scientific name of the plant 
in Kerala you can see this look at this tree so this particular tree in Kerala is known as the Enthu Panna but in reality scientifically the name is the Saikas Sarsi Nalis it is right now it was in news why because this particular tree or this variety or this variety of plant is on the verge of extinction in north part of Kerala after being hit by an unknown plant disease even the cause is important for you to remember because this very very important plant is on the verge of its extinction right and please remember this Enthu Panna or the Saikas Sarsinalis this particular plant that we are referring to is also called as Queen Sago Palm but please remember it is known as Queen Sago Palm but in reality it is not a palm it is I don't know why they have given the name but it is not a palm it's a species of cycad cycads are different palm is very different cycads are basically the seed plants and woody trunks large stiff evergreen leaves that actually differentiates them from the palm and and globally this Saika sarsinalis, this plant, this particular plant is native to South India, like already in Kerala is there, and Sri Lanka. In fact, six out of nine cycad species are native to India alone. And within India, where are you likely to find these trees? They are exclusively distributed in the Western Ghat region, in the states of Kerala, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and somewhere, somehow, the southern parts of Maharashtra. So please remember distribution is absolutely important. Overall, this variety belongs to evergreen tree. It reaches a height of up to 25 feet. And they bear the fruit only after 40 to 50 years of their age. But right now, and, and yeah, very interestingly, the Saikas are known to be the oldest living species on the earth. And this tree belongs to that particular variety particular thing now if you look at the question it, it was a assertion reason kind of thing so clearly my second statement is wrong we just have discussed it is not not palm but it belongs to the cycas variety it is not a palm at all it belongs to the cycad variety so if i put option two as wrong the obvious and only choice is going to be c was it easy sir not at all it was a tough one you, you can skip the question because it's purely based on fact, no scope of guesswork. And this is also not very famous. So in case you have no idea, please skip the question. Only take a risk if you have read it before because this is not a hit and trial kind of question that you can do. Brings us to the question 96 that talks about the dry ice. So which statement is correct about the dry ice? Again, the two statements were given and uh, here, the first statement is very okay, the first statement is correct. So dry ice, we know dry ice, it's commonly used as a cooling agent in food products like ice creams and the frozen desserts. If ever you, uh, you know, order ice cream online, so the pack, the, the, the delivery guy always, uh, you know, carry some dry ice and uh, between which the ice creams are there. So basically a dry ice is always going to be there whenever you are delivering ice cream or any frozen desserts. But what is a dry ice? First, you need to understand that as well. So what is a dry ice? It's the first thing you need to know. So basically, a solid form of carbon dioxide. Yeah, dry ice is nothing but the but a solid uh, carbon dioxide. The solid form of carbon dioxide commonly used as a cooling agent, particularly in foods like ice cream, frozen deserts. The dry ice, this solid form of carbon dioxide, it is colorless. It is orderless and it is non-flammable also not going to catch any fire once it is dissolved if you dissolve the dry ice in the water it is going to form carbonic acid because ultimately it is carbon dioxide only and once the carbonic acid is formed in the water it is going to lower the pH going to make it more acidic very obvious now interestingly the dry ice density increases with decreasing temperature normally what is the range of the dry ice density the density of dry ice varies somewhere between 1.55 to 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter 
that is the normal a, a normal average and overall you will find the application of dry ice at in many industries you will find the application in food preservation cleaning blasting cryo preservation of biological samples preserving the perishable with temporary refrigeration everything can be done using the dry ice and i have i have experienced it personally if you touch that dry ice you are going to get you know little little shocks you will feel because dry ice actually you know whenever you touch it you can actually feel little shocks uh, by touching it it's it's i have personally felt it that's why that's why i'm telling you so here what was the problem first statement is correct the problem was with the second statement so clearly the range is not the right one the dry ice density is not 2.55 it is 1.55 to 1.7 that is the range so range very normally it uh, i mean very rarely this kind of twist can be there normally upsc doesn't uh, twist these values but you never know you never know you may have uh, this kind of question so if my statement number 2 is incorrect the only option is c again because uh, the second statement is incorrect so answer would be c was it easy to guess first one is okay but the second one it is not easy to guess so level was again tough you can take a risk you can take a risk but here again be very sure if you are if you do not want to make any wrong statement count then better to skip and this very very uh, this is probably the it's a bad luck kind of thing if this kind of question comes to your uh, exam it's, it's your bad luck because that is that is really going to be tough for the students because nobody can remember this densities of dry ice or not it's a it's a very next to impossible kind of question to solve if you have not read it properly brings us to the question number 97 again a question of statement 1 statement 2 style but this time the question is about the hemophilia what is a hemophilia first of all hemophilia is one condition i know for sure doesn't affected the females hemophilia is a condition that actually affect the males this is one information if i know it is inheritable disorder but it is not just inheritable it can develop later on in stage also so it can be inheritable it can be genetic or may be acquired later at later stage of life both cases but it ultimately affect the male population not the females so even if i know this much information and if i eliminate number 1 as the incorrect one the only option out of 4 is going to be d because only option d says statement 1 being incorrect so by if you know this little information things become really really easy for you but overall the level of the question was a medium kind of question and may be tough for many people but what about the second statement what is hemophilia we'll first understand we'll come back to the question so hemophilia is what it's a genetic disorder first thing is first hemophilia is a genetic disorder it causes ineffective ineffective blood clotting due to low low levels of clotting factors your blood is not able to clot as it should clot for any normal person hemophilia where the blood doesn't clot the way it should be it can this condition can be inherited from the parents or it may develop later in life primarily affecting the males why and how the causes is simple mutation in genes on the x chromosomes you know the females they have y chromosome the males they have the x chromosomes so here oh no wait 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 forget about it. just just not get into that because then of course then many will say sir we have this xs combination xy combination that's let's forget about that simple focus what i'm telling you this hemophilia hemophilia here the mutation will happen in the genes on the x chromosomes and this mutation in gene on x chromosome is responsible for producing the clotting factor proteins which are essential for blood clot formation but in case of hemophilia this this x chromosome is not going to function as normally it it should be and because of that because of that condition the patient is always going to suffer from less blood clotting and if in case of any injury 
literally they are going to suffer a lot. So I think this, this information is clear in your head. Now yes, so if you know the you know it now, the first being incorrect and second is correct. So X chromosomes are responsible for blood clotting, but mutation makes the things really, really challenging. So first is incorrect, second is correct, answer has to be D sir. Was it easy? Not at all. It was a medium level question. Uh, but you can you can take a little bit of risk in this case and you can solve the question. You may have to skip then you really have to be careful about the question. Question number 98 sir. This question talks about the Shankaracharya temple. First thing is first. The Shankaracharya temple doesn't belong to Ladakh. Shankaracharya temple belongs to Jammu and Kashmir. Is it dedicated to Lord Vishnu? No sir. Shankaracharya temple belongs to Lord Shiva. So the first and the second are not correct. So clearly my option cannot be this. My option cannot be this. My option cannot be this either. Why? Because I know the first two and not correct first and second has to be there in my option. So by simply eliminating the first two, now I can get my answer. So only answer is, it was, was it easy? No, it was a medium question, but could have been eliminated, but could have been attempted by using the elimination technique. We'll talk about Shankaracharya, we'll come back to the question again. I have just told you how to eliminate certain things. So talking about Shankaracharya hill, um, uh, Shankaracharya temple, this temple is on the top of a hill. The name of the hill is also Shankaracharya hill, or it is also called as hill of Solomon. This particular hill is a part of Zabarwan mountain belong, that belongs to Srinagar, Jammu Kashmir. It is, below, it, it is dedicated to Lord Shiva and this Shankaracharya temple is considered to be the oldest temple in Kashmir valley. It is purely made up, made up in a Kashmiri style of architecture. Right? What is this Kashmiri style of architecture? You, you, you should know and you should know about these Kashmiri style architecture. Which particular features? Uh, the Kashmiri style is very renowned for the stone carvings. Kashmiri ar architecture actually developed, uh, you know, somewhere in early medieval Hindu phase and the Muslim phase, uh, somewhere around uh, 14th century onwards. And due to the location of Srinagar on important trade routes or the Kashmir location on the trade routes, uh, the Kashmiri architectural style is inspired by many foreign sources as well. Because you know the many many silk routes and many trade routes they used to pass from the Kashmir. And that's that's why uh, it has a lot of indigenous element but it is also influenced and modified by other versions as well. The main features of the Kashmiri style if by chance you have this question as an art and culture question. So please remember you anytime you think of Kashmiri style you think of all these features. There has to be a lot of steps in the building. There has to be the triangular pediments inspired from Greek. The column walls, again Greek influence. There has to be straight edged pyramidal roofs. There has to be cellular layout, enclosed courtyards. And that they have to be arched, inspired by the Gandhara influence. Also interesting thing, the Buddhists refer this temple as the Jateshwa temple or the Pas Pahar. Even the Buddhist has a connection to this particular temple. So now you know the first and second I already told you they the two statements are not right only third fourth are right and not correct answer has to be a medium level question but could have been but could have been uh, attempted using the elimination technique. That brings us to the next question question number 99. The question is with respect to the global human development index report. Again, another question on report. I told you there would be two, three questions on report and indexes. So global human development index report. What does it say? First, first thing is first. Is it released by UNDP? Yes, sir. It is released by UNDP. What about India's ranking? What about India's ranking? Are we, are, it has, it has India performed better than Bhutan or Bangladesh? We, th we think it, it must have because we're talking about human development, but unfortunately, we have not we have not performed better than 
Bhutan or Bangladesh. Bhutan and Bangladesh both are ahead of us in terms of performance of human development. And that's where big question mark. So second statement is not correct. The right answer is has to be only one only. Statement question answer sir easy straight away could have been attempted if you have read the report. If you have prepared the topic, there would not, there would not be any problem. So what we need to know about the global human development, let's understand. India has climbed only one spot. India has improved its ranking only by one spot. India's present ranking is 134. Out of 193, India used to be 135. Now we have improved only to become 134. So we are talking about the global human development index number one. This particular index published by UNDP and this particular index measures all the human development based on four indicators. And what are these four indicators over which we, we measure the human development? You may have a question as MCQ separately as well. So the human development under the index measured by four indicators. Number one, life expectancy at birth, expected years of schooling. The mean years of schooling, gross national income. Please remember the four star mark, four stars for this particular information. Okay. And the top ranking country right now is Switzerland. India, unfortunately, 134. If you compare India with its neighboring countries, Sri Lanka has done better in terms of human development. Sri Lanka's ranking being 78, China being 75. They are quite high. India is even lower than Bhutan. Bhutan is 125th. Bangladesh is 129th. India is 134. Anything positive for India? See, we have not improved much. But definitely there is one positive thing. India's HDI indicators has at least improved in all the areas. Life expectancy has increased in India from little bit but at least have, have increased. Expected years of schooling has improved to a little bit extent. Many, many years of schooling went up, mean years of schooling also increased. The per capita increase from $6,542 to $6,951. When it comes to India, first state human development index, India has also, this was a global one. So on the lines of the global HDI, even India has started its own state level human development index. And in that, in that, it was brought out by Madhya Pradesh government, but that is way back in 1995. India should actually conduct more such surveys so that, so that we can very competitively, we can measure the level of develop, human development in India as well. Last question number 100 is, which of the following correctly describes the methane set? What is a methane set? Now, the word sat, sat has to do, it has to have some relation with satellite. Yeah, yes, the word sat is for satellite. So what is this? So look at look out for the options. Look out for the options. So clearly it is not any collision. It is not no initiative. Only option is B or C because this word has satellite and the option C also have satellite. So what what statement I should pick? So clearly thanks to elimination I know my answer is going to be between B or C. Now in this kind of question, it was a medium one. At least now you have a 50-50 option. You are in a position to take some risk. So be careful the word 99% the word sat is, is going to have some relation to satellites. So that way also logically at least you can eliminate the other option. But let me give you some interesting detail first. We'll come back to the question. So we're talking about the methane set. Okay. What is the methane set? This methane sat it's a satellite project led by environmental defense fund it's a u.s non-profit organization and why they have launched this satellite what why they have launched methane set methane set is a satellite is going to orbit earth 15 times daily and in those 15 times it's going to focus monitoring the oil and gas sector aim is very simple the name is methane sat methane satellite what way what what it is supposed to do so obviously this satellite is going to collect the data the revealing data like you know from which sources methane emissions are happening 
methane emissions are happening of what intensity, how the methane emissions are changing. So, everything is being recorded by the methane set and be, re be very, uh, re uh, be re do remember this fact, it is going to orbit earth every uh, like uh, for 15 times every day. Please remember, this is not the first spacecraft to identify, quantify methane emissions, but definitely it is in news. So, that, that is why methane set is going to be very important. But please remember, this is not the first time we are doing something like that. If the question claim for the first time it has happened, it has not. What I need to remember about methane, we know about methane a lot. Methane is a powerful greenhouse gas. It's the second largest contributor to global warming after carbon dioxide. In fact, it is responsible for 30% global heating since industrial revolution. If you compare the carbon dioxide and methane, methane is a short lived, it's a short lived uh, gas. It's not going to be there as long as carbon dioxide, but the global warming potential of methane is very high. Methane is 80 times more potent in global warming than carbon dioxide over a 20, period, 20 year period. If for 20 years, one molecule of carbon dioxide, one molecule of or one unit of methane is there. So obviously that one unit is going to give you 80 times more global warming than the carbon dioxide. This, these are some important things and yes, one more thing guys, the exposure to ground level ozone that, that we always talk about. So, this methane is also responsible for creating that ground level ozone. Ground level ozone is not present naturally, it is a secondary pollutant which is being created by the primary uh, pollutant. It is a secondary pollutant. Which one? I am talking about ozone, not the methane. Methane is a primary pollutant only. It is not, not pollutant, uh, primary uh, greenhouse gas only. So, clearly, now I have got my answer, sir. So, right, uh, right here, like I told you, the answer has to be from B or C options. My right answer is going to be B because now I, I have got the information of the satellite orbiting 15 times and monitoring everything which is there in option number 2 medium level question take a risk because you are you have eliminated the wrong options if you are at 50 50 kind of thing you can still take little bit of risk but with logic with some calculations okay guys so that is all from my side uh, in this video i really hope you have enjoyed the test number 8 and you must have learned a lot of things so see you guys uh, after a week see you guys uh, after a week for test number 10 that is going to be your last test my best wishes for the upcoming UPSC exam. If you have enjoyed our video, then do give us a thumbs up. Do not forget to share your feedback in the comment section box. How did you enjoy this video? What you have learned from this video? And if you really like the way I am explaining things to you, if you did, do let me know in the comment section box. Thank you so much. God bless you. Jai Hind. Jai Bharat.